Good day to you all. Thank you for joining me. COVID-19 is what we're all talking about. It's what is massively impacting all of our lives right now. But what can we do to support ourselves? My name is Jan Clemenson. I'm a nutrition and lifestyle therapist from Boundless Energy. Having recently recovered from virus-like symptoms myself, I've been asked many times, what did I do to help myself recover? So I decided to put together this video slideshow to help answer some of those questions, but also to help others who may wish to know what they can do to help support themselves during these difficult times. Okay, I'm just gonna switch over now to the slides. Just bear with me. Okay. Okay, here we go. So what I want to talk about um, today is just a little bit about me. So you have uh, an idea about my professional background in the health industry, what the current advice is with regard to this particular virus, what the pathophysiology is of this virus, what we know so far from the research, support strategies that you could utilize uh, to help yourself, summary uh, of the advice, and then if you require any further help, what you can do. So just a little bit about me. I'm a UK registered nutritional therapist with a first class honours degree in nutritional medicine. My professional body is BANT, which is the British Association of Nutrition and Lifestyle Medicine. And my regulatory body is CNHC, which is the Complementary Natural Healthcare Council. Currently, I have my own uh, nutrition practice called Boundless Energy. I also work as a functional medicine practitioner on an online abundant energy uh, program. I also work as a clinic tutor for the renowned Institute of Optimum Nutrition. Previously, I've worked for a supplement company. I have lectured for the College of Naturopathic Medicine, and I've written and published a book uh, called The Energy Solution. So just moving on to what the current BANT position is. So this is my professional body. There is no current scientific evidence to date that any dietary or supplementary recommendation can prevent a person from catching this particular virus. So that's the standpoint from which uh, I am coming from. Um, the current guidelines are social distancing, hand washing, and other measures currently being enforced by the government. These are the only valid prevention strategies that we know so far. So uh, BANT members such as myself cannot provide any specific advice on this particular virus because this is a public health matter. However, I can provide some general advice that you could uh, implement. So just looking at um, uh, the recommendations of my professional body is for eating, it's support your health by eating for wellness and well-being. And these principles have been well established in the evidence uh, of how you can support yourself. The basic principles will apply to you, whatever your health goal or your genetic in individuality, because we're all different. Uh, there's no one diet that fits all, but there are some general principles um, by which we can apply. And the first one is a rainbow diet. Having as many different colored fruit and vegetables in your, in your diet per day. So um, this can be, uh, there's a whole range of different colors from the reds and oranges to the yellows, the greens, the blue, black, purples, and the, the white, tan, orange colors. It's about mixing them all up so you have each of these colors throughout the day. And the reason being is uh, that you're getting a more diverse range of nutrients over and above just vitamins and minerals. Uh, so there's a whole host of phytonutrients in foods, um, but each food has uh, different levels, different ratios. So by having the whole rainbow diet, you're pretty much covering a, a broad spectrum of nutrients. The more nutrients you have, uh, the better will be your health. Also, one of the basic um, principles is hydration. So many people are just not hydrated. And uh, this is such a basic principle. If you think about that uh, your body contains about 65 to 75% water, uh, and to function optimally, it really needs to have a high level of water. 
everything in your body works in a watery environment. So increasing your water intake is a, is a, a key aspect here. I mean, the minimum water intake you'd be looking at is 1.5 litres, which is the size of a large bottle of water. That's the minimum. Um, the more uh, you exercise, the more you'll need. Uh, so just increasing your water intake, and that can be uh, through herbal teas as well. Um, and then uh, decreasing your alcohol, caffeine and sugary drinks, uh, because they, they actually um, uh, cause you to lose uh, water rather than hold on to the water. Lean protein, um, uh, this is uh, something that you can easily implement. Things like fish, poultry, eggs, and vegetable sources of protein, which can be uh, beans, uh, legumes, lentils, nuts, another good one. And limiting your red and processed meat. So processed meat is, uh, uh, is, is a big one that you can try and limit at this time. Also introducing some healthy fats. These would be like oily fish, so the likes of salmon, uh, tuna, mackerel, avocados, nuts, seeds, and olive oil. And whole foods, uh, generally, so root vegetables, they can be anything from potatoes, white or sweet potatoes, uh, to carrots, parsnips, turnips, and whole grains. Um, so these uh, um, will be the, the likes of... Uh, of, um, of rye or barley or whole wheat and um, what you want to do is it's the brown versions essentially uh, of your grains if it's white it's likely to have been uh, refined and what that means is all the the micronutrients will have been processed out so micronutrients are things like vitamins minerals and phytonutrients which are often forgotten about and sleep Sleep is such an important aspect of any health program. It's where you, it's where you, um, your body actually uh, recovers. It repairs, it recovers, uh, and it detoxifies. So having about seven to eight hours uh, of sleep per night um, is the optimal uh, level. Some people need less, some people need more. I'm going to bed uh, around about 10 o'clock. I'm gonna go into a little bit more on sleep later on, but this is just general guidelines. And exercise, keep moving. Uh, that's one of the key things, especially at home. Um, it's so easy uh, to not move around, but you really need to keep moving throughout the day. In addition to you, your one day, um, one day of exercise. So your once a day of exercise. Uh, and during this time, it's probably best to avoid uh, any high intensity exercise or too much. Um, because what that can do, that can place a big stress on your body um, and you want the nutrients to actually uh, to boost your immune system rather than to be diverted elsewhere. So just looking at what the current research uh, has shown on the actual virus itself, which organs, which systems it's affecting. Lungs, that's one that probably most of us know, uh, the cough being a, a big major uh, a symptom. Uh, there are actually, with regards to the lungs, uh, there are three types of symptoms. There's the mild illness with um, the upper respiratory tract symptoms. There's the more severe pneumonia, but that's not life-threatening. And then there's the severe pneumonia with the acute respiratory distress. And that's the type of, uh, if you get that part, that particular symptom, then that's the one that's going to put you into, into hospital. It's also affecting um, cardiovascular system in severe cases, um, where there can be heart inflammation or arrhythmias. So arrhythmias uh, about your heart rhythm um, uh, being disturbed. It's also really affecting the liver. Uh, your liver is your main detoxification organ here. So what, what the research is showing is between 15 and 53% of people with the symptoms are actually having liver injury. The, for mild cases, percentage uh, is a lot lower, probably near the 15 level, but for the more severe cases, it's right up there to the 53%. So there's big issues going on with the liver at this time. Senses, so there's a lot of smell um, uh, that's been reported by many people. So we know the senses are, are affected. The immune system, okay, so that's a big one. So that's part and parcel of, of uh, the body dealing with any kind of virus. So there's very high levels of inflammatory signal molecules called cytokines. So lots of inflammation going on with this virus. In the digestive system, the most common reported problem is diarrhea and in the nervous system, headaches and nausea. So what are the risk factors then? What's the research showing? 
Um, so certainly with other health current condition where they exist, there's definitely an increased risk uh, factor. So anything affecting the lungs, any pulmonary diseases, and that includes asthma, or even if you smoke as well, that, that can increase your risk. Anywhere where the immune system is compromised, so this would be uh, for the elderly where the, the, they're very frail, you have diabetes, cardiovascular disease, a chronic kidney or liver disease, so um, your detoxification organs are very much affected in this. Um, kidneys is another way that your body will detoxify. Uh, if someone is undergoing chemotherapy, or if someone's on any kind of steroidal or immunosuppressant medications. And when there are two or more health conditions, then that risk of being admitted to hospital and even requiring ventilation or even dying increases. So they're the risks that we know so far with regard to this particular virus. Let's just look at the fatality rates. They're running around about uh, 2% uh, at the moment. And you can see here that I've divided it between uh, the age groups. Uh, as most people are aware uh, that the elderly are far more affected than the younger um, population. Uh, 80 plus obviously has the, uh, the greatest risk with a 14.8% fatality rate so far. Um, and right down in the bottom, uh, 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 youngsters uh, under the age of nine, no fatalities reported so far. One of the interesting statistics though uh, is the difference between males and females. Uh, currently what the uh, statistics are showing is that uh, males are almost twice as likely as females uh, to actually die from this particular virus. So your immune system is heavily involved um, in dealing with any type of virus. If you want to know uh, just how your immune system um, deals with a viral uh, infection, you might want to just have a look at this short video um, over on the Alliance for Natural Health website. It's around about uh, 12 to 15 minutes, and it gives you a really nice, good overview of um, how your, your immune system would work in any viral infection. So that's worth checking out if you've got um, a, a spare 15 minutes. So moving on to the immune system generally and the defenses. Um, this is uh, generally what our, all our immune systems have. There are three lines of defense. The first one is a barrier function. So this would be your skin, your mucous membranes, and your excretions, uh, such as stool excretions and urine. It's a non-specific response to. So what that means is uh, this is the type of response you'd have to any infection, whether it be viral, bacterial, or anything else. The second response, uh, again, it's a non-specific, but if, uh, if any pathogen then overcomes the barrier function, then this is when you're gonna get into uh, a lot of inflammation. So inflammation is very much part and parcel uh, of your immune system uh, response. This is going to include uh, uh, certain molecules such as cytokines, which we know are high with uh, COVID-19, uh, and also some other uh, sensors called inflammasomes, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. Um, so there's going to be inflammation, there's going to be fever. If you get symptoms of COVID-19, you're into this second line of defense here. Uh, the virus has already passed your barrier functions um, and your body is now responding uh, with inflammation. And the third line of defense is um, once the, uh, the second stage has got things under control, this is when you have immune memory cells and antibodies, and this is when you acquire immunity. And this is what's called specific immunity. So your body is reacting against that specific virus, um, and not, it's not a general re reaction. So what we do know from the research with COVID-19 is there are very high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. The greater the severity of your symptoms, the higher the level of these cytokines. So it's pretty clear with this virus that there's a lot of inflammation that is happening in the body. So just talking about inflammasomes. So these are intracellular sensors or receptors that induce inflammation in response to infectious pathogens. So these are actually inside your cells themselves. And what they do is they flag up um, to other immune cells that there is a pathogen and that the body needs to respond um, in a specific way. So infectious pathogens can be viruses such as the COVID-19, can be bacteria, fungi or parasites. 
what they do is uh, in flammar cells, they promote the release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are uh, immune cells, uh, signaling molecules. So signaling to other cells in the body, something is going on. And they trigger a whole cascade of inflammatory responses. Within inflammasomes, there are four different types, uh, but the interesting one to be aware of is one called NLRP3. It's the most wide-ranging sensor and is potentially involved in COVID-19. This specific sensor, uh, although it's not, um, it's, there's no evidence yet that it's involved in COVID-19, it does actually initiate these type of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which we know uh, is happening with this virus infection. And also as well, this particular sensor has been activated in other coronavirus infections, such as SARS-CoV-2. So whilst there's no evidence per se at this stage, there's a high likelihood that this may well be involved in the virus itself. Uh, as the research comes out, um, this may well confirm it. So just going over inflammation generally. So inflammation um, is a can be positive and it's a survival mechanism um, in the body. So a normal healthy environment is weakly inflammatory. And inflammation is part and parcel of our general metabolic activity. It's necessary for cell breakdown, for repair, repair and renewal. And this is what happens in all of our bodies. So all of our cells will break down and they will repair and renew over time. Some cells break down faster uh, than others, but they will all break down and they'll all repair and renew. When you get excess inflammation, you do get the cell breakdown, but often you don't get the repair and renewal process. Uh, and so this, this, this can cause tissue dysfunction and destruction. It's central to absolutely all disease processes. There's always an inflammatory component. So it's really important to be aware that you need to repair and renew. Um, it's a major part of what happens in your body. So I want to just look at melatonin. Uh, and I've raised this um, because of that inflammasome center, um, a sensor that we mentioned, the NLRP3. So melatonin is your sleep hormone. It also modulates your immune system and reduces inflammation. And the target of melatonin in the, in the immune system is actually NLRP3. So this is your immune sensor. And um, this is really, really important because it's all to do with pathogens. So melatonin levels, they actually decrease with age. Children have 10 times the amount of melatonin compared to an elderly adult. Now this, according to the research, could be a potential reason why children seldom exhibit severe symptoms of COVID-19. Melatonin is also an autophagy regulator. Autophagy is a process of repair and renewal of damaged cells. This is something that happens overnight whilst you sleep. It's also an essential process in resisting infection by degrading pathogens. So there is this potential melatonin connection. So this is really important uh, and very much linked to sleep. So this is something that, uh, that you can uh, look at as one of the strategies. And I'll look at that a little bit more later on. But also I want to link melatonin to cortisol. So cortisol is your stress hormone. These two hormones work together, but at opposing times and they stabilize your body clock. So let's look a little bit more into this. Melatonin is produced in response to darkness. Production starts around about 9 p.m. Cortisol, your stress hormone, works uh, opposite to melatonin. So what happens is when melatonin is produced around about nine o'clock, cortisol, your stress hormone, should start to go down. Uh, and it goes down through the evening. Then in the morning, cortisol should peak early in the morning to uh, help you wake up at which point melatonin should go down. So they, they kind of work up and down like, uh, uh, like that. Um, they have the peaks and troughs, um, but essentially, you know, your stress hormone cortisol should be waking up in the morning and ebbing in the evening. Melatonin should be uh, peaking in, uh, or should be rising in the evening and ebbing in the morning. So they work together and they work um, to, uh, to help uh, regulate your body clock. So what actually is your body clock? 
you've probably heard about it, but uh, you, ha you may have an idea. Well, essentially, your body clock keeps all your body processes running according to a 24-hour schedule. Uh, it covers everything from eating to sleeping, temperature, energy and hormone production, and repair and regeneration. So everything is on this 24-hour schedule. So it's really important that this should be uh, synchronized. So when you look at things that can affect the, this body clock and, get, and knock things out of balance, because they do, and certainly in today's society, the body clock is, uh, is very out of uh, is sync for most people. So when you're looking at uh, things that can affect it, with regards to melatonin, the only thing that can affect the production of melatonin is retinal light exposure. That said, cortisol though, uh, which is easily disrupted by many stress factors, can impact melatonin production in the evening. So if, you have, if you're highly stressed and you've got cortisol levels high uh, in the evening um, when melatonin should produce, it will, what that means is that generally melatonin um, production is delayed further into the evening. This can prevent sleep problems, this can cause sleep problems, but also um, it impacts this repair and generation process. So let's just look at certain potential diet strategies that you could look at. Now that we know uh, what the research is saying and you've seen some general recommendations, what else can you do? So the first key thing is the general recommendations of eating for wellness and well-being. These are well-proven, uh, researched uh, ways of eating. So start with that as your basics. But what else can you do? So one of the things you can do is look at some of the organs and systems that we know are affected in this particular virus. And look at foods that can help support those particular systems. So when you're looking at, at the lungs, so supportive foods that can help are things like apples, green tea, leafy green vegetables, garlic, ginger, salmon, turmeric, the spice, and bananas. Uh, and as we go through these organs and systems, you will see some general overlap uh, with foods um, to make it a little bit easier. Looking at your cardiovascular system, uh, these are things like oats, salmon, whole grains, walnuts, leafy green vegetables, avocado and berries. Liver, dark green leafy vegetables, really, really important for liver and detoxification. And these can be things like broccoli, kale, spinach, spring greens, rocket watercress, lettuce, asparagus, and cabbage. Looking at the scent, so this loss of smell and taste uh, is potentially linked to, uh, to zinc. Uh, zinc is a, a micronutrient, a mineral, that's super important for the immune system. Um, it's often very low in most people's diet. So eating, and it's very much linked to this loss of taste and smell. So eating foods that are high in zinc uh, can help with that and also help with the immune system. So these are things like lamb, pumpkin and hemp seeds, beef, chickpeas, lentils, cashew nuts, mushrooms, spinach, avocado and chicken. The immune system itself, uh, then you're looking at things that can really help um, with kind of anti-inflammatory aspects. So ginger and turmeric, great uh, spices that you can add, highly uh, anti-inflammatory, citrus fruits generally, so you're looking at lemons, limes, oranges, grapefruit, so forth. Yellow, orange, red fruit and vegetables are high in vitamin C. Red bell peppers, that's not a, a vegetable that most people tend to think of high in vitamin C, but it, it has really high levels. Parsley, parsley is like nature's multivitamin, multimineral, and um, you can buy uh, quite large uh, uh, clumps or quite, quite large uh, levels of it now in the supermarket, just put it in everything. Oily fish, chia seeds and flax seeds. Look at the digestive system. Again, we have overlap, overlap between um, fresh vegetable and fruits, whole grains, healthy fats, peppermint tea. So peppermint uh, um, is really calming for your digestive system. But also you might want to look at some kind of probiotic foods as well, which are really going to uh, help support your good bacteria. Most of your immune system is located in your digestive system. About 80% of immune cells are located there. So uh, supporting your digestive system this time uh, is hugely beneficial. So um, probiotic foods can be things like yogurt, 
kombucha, which is a fermented tea, uh, kefir and sauerkraut. Also looking at the nervous system, um, you might want to look at, at things like, uh, uh, particularly for, for headaches uh, in particular, or, or kind of migraines, so uh, uh, high tryptophan foods. So tryptophan is an amino acid. Uh, it's the precursor to serotonin. Um, serotonin is your happy hormone. Again, this is produced mainly in your gut, um, but there's a big link uh, uh, with, with serotonin, uh, migraines, uh, and, and headaches. So eating foods that can uh, that are uh, uh, helpful uh, that have high quantities of tryptophan can help with that. Serotonin as well is also a precursor to melatonin. So these foods are going to help with sleep as well. And these are things like salmon, poultry, eggs, spinach, seeds and nuts, and carbohydrates as well. Carbohydrates is really important for tryptophan, but carbohydrates from fruit, vegetable and whole grains, not from processed foods. So what foods uh, should you be avoiding? These are foods that are going to deplete your nutrient resources, essentially. So processed foods is a big one. So these are things like frozen bag boxed uh, foods. These are devoid of nutrients and loaded with additives and preservatives. So one of the things about processed food is that they do have these vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients and nutrients processed out. Yeah, it's these very micronutrients that are used as cofactors uh, in uh, the enzymes of your body. So if you're not taking them in from the food that you eat, then your body is going to have to utilize them from stored, stored resources. Um, and uh, what you don't want to be doing um, is to depleting your nutrient resource, your micronutrient resources at such a time as when they may be needed for your immune system. Artificial sweeteners such as aspartamine, sucralose, and saccharin. Um, diet sodas, again, loaded with sugar, missing micronutrients. Trans fats. Uh, so these are things that really impact your, um, your, uh, your, your liver and your cardiovascular system. Um, and these are things that we find in, in, um, in uh, processed oils, margarines, baked goods, um, things like biscuits, cakes, pies, crackers, crisps, chips, pizza, and frozen dinners. And these are refined carbohydrates, which we've spoken about. These are things like white bread, uh, rice, flour, pasta, baked goods like cakes, biscuits, donuts, pastries, crisps, crackers, and fruit juice. And alcohol as well. Try and minimize or avoid your alcohol. Uh, so, the, so the liver, uh, heavily involved in detoxification um, of alcohol uh, and be using your nutrients to, uh, to actually detoxify the alcohol. So just looking at body clock regulation, so again, super important um, uh, for your immune system as well as other bodily functions. This is your 24-hour clock, uh, sync to the night-day cycle. Um, if, you, if this is disrupted, then it weakens your immune system. There are four key aspects to body clock reg regulation. The first one is light exposure. This is absolutely key to resetting your clock. So a uh, morning uh, a light exposure, going outside in the morning uh, is absolutely key to resetting this clock. So uh, we're allowed out once per day for exercise. So do it first thing in the morning. Um, that's when you're gonna get uh, the bright light um, from the sunlight and it's sunny at the moment and hopefully that will continue um, and that's really going to help to regulate your body clock and the other key aspect of light exposure is evening blue light blocking so blue light is the lights that um, you would have or, or that would come from things like a, a computers laptop mobile phones tvs uh, and light uh, light bulbs generally um, so the things that you can do to minimize that with regards to, um, to computers and laptops, you can download software, free software, such as Flux, and this will just take the blue light out of your screen. With phones, uh, they have a night shift setting. So again, it's a similar principle. You can just take the, it takes the blue light out of the screen. It stops that blocking, uh, uh, the blue light blocking. The blue light uh, impacts melatonin, which is why it's important to block. Uh, the production, um, and then even the simple strategy is stop watching TV about 30 minutes to 60 minutes before you go to bed. Uh, even using red light bulbs in, in, uh, in a lamp in your bedroom, um, and then that just helps to, uh, to stop the production, uh, stop the blocking of melatonin production. 
So the second uh, key stimulator of body clock regulation is food timing. So again, it's about eating in line um, with nature, really. Eat during your daylight hours and at the same time uh, each day, rather than, uh, than what happens generally or has been um, in today's society, where we tend to eat more in the evening because of our lifestyles. Try and push things forward so you're eating earlier during the day uh, and not really eating so much late uh, in the evening. And also, if you can uh, have like a 12 hour overnight fast, that's really gonna help this uh, autophagy. So, and again, autophagy is this repair and renewal process, so which is super, super important um, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for helping uh, your body to maintain its function, including the immune system. So a 12 hour fast, it's much easier to do than uh, you think it is. It's really about uh, condensing your food into a 12 hour period. So maybe if you start off with your breakfast at seven o'clock, then you finish eating at 7 p.m. It's as simple as that. Movement is also another key factor that regulates the body clock. If you, if you exercise in the morning, this really amplifies the effects of your, uh, your body clock, which is called the circadian rhythm, to reset the clock. You don't have to do intense exercise. It can be very much about just moving, gentle stretching. Uh, and if you combine this with getting outside, so doing your morning exercise uh, in the morning is, uh, can be super important uh, for this. Uh, so it really just helps. Uh, uh, to amplify this and get your body clock back into sync. And temperature, so temperature is, um, is another key regulator uh, uh, of the body clock. So in the evening, um, uh, when the temperature to, when your temperature drops, this is a key signal uh, to the brain that it's time for sleep. And in the morning when the temperature warms up, uh, again, this signals wake, wakefulness, so it's time to wake up in the morning. You can help along those signals uh, quite uh, easily, keeping your bedroom cool at night, um, uh, having so the heating coming on in the morning. Uh, also as well, um, uh, before you go to bed, you can have a bath or a shower, uh, because when you get out of the bath or the shower, your temperature will drop quite significantly. And that's a big signal to the brain to say it's time to sleep. Which moving on to uh, start moves on to sleep strategies. What else can we do apart from body clock regulation? So remember, sleep is super important. This is when repair, regeneration, and detoxification during sleep occurs. And with any kind of pathogen, there will be an element of detoxification, which is why the liver is massively impacted in this virus. The body needs to get rid of the virus. So this all happens um, during the evening. So you really want to try and optimize your sleep uh, during this time. Generally, uh, the sleep period, um, the optimal is between eight and nine and, uh, and a half, or say the sleep optimal period is about seven and a half hours. But to get the seven and a half hour uh, sleep period, you really need to be in bed for around about eight to nine and a half hours because you won't go to sleep as soon as you get into bed. So uh, giving yourself a little bit of leeway will allow you to sleep for the seven and a half hours. Bedtime, and again, timing can be more important than the actual number of hours that you sleep. Optimal time between 9 and 10 p.m. Uh, and this really is uh, all in line with the 24-hour clock. Melatonin will start to be produced at 9 o'clock. That in turn sets off a whole host of um, other biological factors, including this all important autophagy, which is about repair, regeneration, detoxification. If your bed timing is pushed uh, uh, much later back, you know, into when you're talking about midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, and you see a lot of people doing this, particularly uh, when people are at home, uh, then what's gonna happen is this repair, regeneration, and detoxification is, is gonna be massively impaired. And that is gonna impact not just your energy, but also your immune function. So uh, going to bed earlier uh, can impact so many systems. So timing matters much, much more than duration. You just have to try it for yourself. Try sleeping seven and a half hours after going to bed at nine or 10 o'clock, and then the same if you go to bed at one o'clock in the morning. You'll feel different. Environment, make sure that your bedroom is dark, that it's cool, we've discussed temperature, and that it's peaceful, there's not much noise. Um, so noise disturbance can be a real problem uh, for people sleeping. Um, what can you do if you've got a lot of noise um, uh, at night? 
Well, a couple of things. You can have like white noise, which is a fan, you can switch that on, or pink noise, which is the sound of rain or wind. Um, and you can, you can easily get some of these sounds um, onto your phone, have an app that will produce some of these sounds, and this can help block out the sound and help you sleep. What should you do if you wake up in the night? Because some people do, many people do wake up in the night. What can you do? Well, the first thing is stay out of your head. Stop getting into that, that, uh, that repeated thought process, so the worries uh, that come out. Um, you could try some deep breathing. Um, so you're just focusing on the breath and that keeps you out of your head. You could try some meditation. Um, and what you should avoid doing is switching on the light because as soon as you switch on the light, um, that will wake you up. So, um, so that's a key thing. Try not to switch on the light. If you do need to switch on the light, uh, then you can um, have like this is when a red light will will be really helpful, uh, and you can just switch on a red light. And the other thing uh, about sleeping is to avoid morning snoozes. Train your body to get up and go, and it will do. So exercise. So we know exercise is important. The government are saying um, go out and exercise once per day. Uh, we know it's good for uh, for mental well-being, but also as well for physical well-being. But also as well, it improves immune function. So we're back to immunity again. So exercise. It can really be classified in two ways. One is uh, exercise activity itself, but also the length of time that you're sitting because they're both as important as each other. So even if you're doing um, some formal exercise, whether it be walking, running or cycling, you still need to move uh, during the day. So avoiding this sedentary behavior, very difficult um, when we're all stuck at home, but this massively impacts your energy production. Um, if you are sitting around, it backs up your energy system. Why is that important? Well, your immune system uh, will use a lot of energy. The more energy you can produce, the more effective will be your immune system. So you want to move more during the day. As a rule of thumb, uh, try and move every hour so you're not just sitting down uh, for such long periods. It can be as simple as uh, going to the toilet, going to make a cup of tea, move to another room, but you need to stand up, you need to move. If you want to be a little bit more adventurous, you can do what I've started to do. And it's on the hour, every hour. I am running on the spot or sprinting on the spot for 30, uh, 30 seconds to 60 seconds. It's keeping me moving, stopping me seizing up. Um, so that's something you may want to look at uh, as well, if you want to just up the ante a little bit. When we're looking at exercise um, with regards to immune function, then what you're looking at really is, intent, uh, is moderate uh, intensity exercise rather than the high intensity exercise and you really need to be moving for 30 minutes um, per day as a, as a minimum um, uh, so that gives you a, a good idea and the reason why you want to be avoiding this high intensity or long endurance exercise is it puts a lot of stress on your body uh, and when you've got quite a lot of stress this depletes the nutrients and the energy reserves that you would need for immune system if your immune system is activated um, with, uh, say, a viral infection, it's going to use up a massive amount of your energy. Your energy resources will be diverted to the activated immune system. So you want to, uh, so you don't want to be depleting your energy resources uh, unnecessarily at such times. And also, as well, exercise, you may want to look at something like yoga or Tai Chi, um, you can, there are a lot of videos that you can follow at home. These are exercises that have shown to reduce the stress response and put you into this relaxation uh, response. Uh, the relaxation is your rest, your, di your digest, detoxify, repair and renewal. Uh, and they do this by activating a specific nerve called the vagus nerve, which is, which is the main nerve uh, of that particular, of that uh, rest, digest, that relaxation um, response. Stress management. So we touch on stress, uh, the stress link with uh, the link with with melatonin. The fact that stress can deplete nutrients uh, at such time. Um, so what can you do to minimise uh, your stress at such times? Uh, so the three strategies that you can use. Deep breathing, for example, this is your fastest way out of any stress. 
And deep breathing means breathing from your diaphragm. So when you breathe from your diaphragm, you're really opening up at your chest cavity and allowing the oxygen and more oxygen to, uh, to be taken into your system. Or you can look at something like self-nurturing activities. These are essentially doing something that you love. If you do something that you love and, you, and that you enjoy, it takes you out of the stress response and into the relaxation response. You can looking at, uh, look at your senses. This is another way of taking out your stress. So um, whichever sense works best for you, it could be listening to music. It could be a, a perfume smell. Uh, it could be something that, uh, that you look at or something that you touch. Whatever works for you, try them out and see if it works. There are certain stress management strategies that you can use, uh, uh, so using your brain uh, to get you out of stress. Um, a good one is what's called the four A's. So looking at if there's a stress in front of you, can you avoid the stress? If you can, great, do that. If you can't, can you alter it? Uh, if you can't alter it, can you adapt to it? And if you can't adapt to it, can you accept it? So one of the things that we're all having to accept at the moment are the restrictions based on our movement and having to stay in the house uh, as much as possible. Um, so uh, this is one of the things that you just have to accept. It's nothing that you can change right now and you have to make the most of it. If you keep railing against it, that's just going to put you into the stress response. Another great thing is to get out into nature, into parks, countryside, seaside, uh, where you can. Obviously, you still have to uh, keep your distance uh, as we're doing social distancing. But again, this is going to be part and parcel of your exercise regime. Get out into nature. Uh, the research is quite, is quite clear with that. The more you get into, into nature, uh, the more it will reduce your stress uh, response. Um, and also as well, laughter and fun. Again, it gets you out of the stress response. Do something that makes you laugh, that you enjoy whether it be watching uh, a comedy uh, show on TV or whatever it may be, laughing with your friends, this is a great way, great way to reduce that stress. And meditation. So again, this is another thing that you can do. Uh, you can do uh, guided soundtracks, um, which you can, with lots of things on, uh, on the internet that you can find. If that's not your band, then you can try a moving meditation, such as, uh, as walking. That can be a meditation in, in itself. Just don't uh, listen to any music or talk on the phone. Simply just walk out in nature. And that's almost like a meditation itself. So there are a number of different strategies that you can use to help you get out the stress response. So just choose one that really appeals to you and see if it works for you. So I just want to touch on, on supplements, on nutritional supplements, and just reiterate, there's no current scientific evidence that supplements can prevent a person from catching this particular virus. So supplements, though, are very part and parcel of what a nutritionist and other healthcare professional, uh, professionals um, uh, will utilise. Supplements are always in addition to the diet. Diet is always the first place to start, uh, and they're used to support body systems and functions. Um, so uh, they are something that I use regularly. There's something that I use to help me um, to, uh, to uh, recover from the virus. Um, but people do respond to supplements in different ways. Uh, and there are also contraindications that exist with certain medications. So supplements really uh, should be used um, in conjunction with advice from a healthcare professional who actually knows um, what to do with supplements, what to recommend, uh, and how they could possibly impact you both positively uh, and negatively. Um, so that is something to be aware of when it comes to supplements. So in summary, uh, I just want to go over what we've covered. I've heard quite a lot already so far. Uh, you may have to watch this video several times because you probably won't have remembered uh, a lot of what's been said. But um, here's a quick summary of what I've been talking about today. So first of all, follow the government recommendations, um, social distancing, hand washing, and other measures that they are advocating at any particular time. These are the things uh, that, that are known to help prevent catching the virus. So follow what the government is saying. What else can you do for yourselves? Well, you can eat for wellness and well-being. Um, this is a key thing that you can really start to implement for yourself. So you can look at some of the recommendations that the Professional Body uh, is recommending. These are recommendations that have been clearly shown by the evidence to help 
with health and well-being. And you can look at some of the specific foods for, for body systems that are affected in this virus that I went through. Body clock regulation, this is something that you could easily introduce for yourself, um, looking at your light exposure, uh, when you eat, uh, when you move, uh, and also temperature control as well. Improving sleep, this is a key aspect and something um, that, that would be important for you, not just uh, in terms of this virus, but generally going forwards as well and helping with your health generally. Have a look at some strategies, see what would be applicable for you. Daily exercise, if you're not doing it already, uh, then make sure you, you are doing it. Um, so this is something you really want to do on a daily basis. Even if the weather's not so good, get outside. And if you can move in the morning, even better. That's really going to help um, to really regulate this body clock function. And reduce stress. So um, again, this can be a key thing. You know, uh, stress can be co coming from worries at this time. So many people are fearful and worried about what's happening uh, with the virus, what's happening with the job, what's happening with the economy. The more you worry, the more you put yourself into stress. Easy said than done um, in, in reducing this, I appreciate, but look at some of the strategies that you might want to look at implementing, particularly the uh, the acceptance of, of certain things when you can't do anything about it. If you can't control anything, then sometimes you might just have to accept it and look for ways, that, uh, other things that you can actually control. So choose a strategy that actually uh, uh, works for you or that appeals for you and just give it a go and see what works. So there's a lot of information that I have uh, given there um, that you can help yourself with. If you feel as though that you need any extra help or any support from, uh, from a health professional, um, then just uh, be aware that I am actually offering a special offer at the moment for one-off uh, online consultation uh, for anyone who is interested in just having a personalized health and well-being support plan put in place for them during this particular period. If this is something that you feel would you're interested in or if you'd like to ask any questions of me, uh, then feel free to pop over to my website where you can contact me. My website is www.boundless-energy.co.uk. Um, so do have a look there if you feel that may help you. So I just want to say, so that's the uh, end of the presentation. Um, thank you uh, very much uh, for listening to me. If you've made it all the way to the end uh, of this video, uh, it, it's taken some time, so hopefully you have made it to the end. Um, uh, I, I wish you well, I hope you keep safe, and I hope you do implement some of these strategies, whether it's for this virus or going forwards, just generally for your health. Thank you very much for, for listening. Take care, have a great day.